Well, good morning and welcome this morning. If you uh, came to our Christmas Eve services or uh, maybe you're a guest here today from our winter shelter um, or found your way here some other way, welcome. We're glad you're here today. Uh, You know, when I was uh, first heard the news that someone I knew from high school was accused of committing a violent crime, my first thought was there must be some kind of mistake. He protested his innocence. People from our friend group um, spoke on his behalf as character witnesses. He ended up being arrested, and, and he ended up taking a plea bargain on a lesser charge to avoid a trial. He was sentenced to weekend incarceration so he could keep his job. But then a few years later, he told one of my mutual friends that he had actually done what he had been accused of. And I remember thinking to myself, you think you know somebody. Maybe you've said that to yourself before. You think you know someone. And, and often we say that when someone we know does something that seems completely out of character with what we thought we knew about them. Maybe people have said that about you before or about me before. When we've said or done things that, that seem out of character with what other people thought they knew about us. Does anyone really know another person? You think you know somebody. You know, back in 1955, two psychologists from the University of California developed a tool that's called the Johari Window. Maybe you've seen it before. Um, The Johari Window divides our lives into four different quadrants. The, The first quadrant consists of the things that we know about ourselves that we also let other people know about ourselves. These are our ideas and our beliefs, our opinions and our actions that we share with other people. These are the things that we post on social media or the opinions we share in conversations or the the feelings that we share with other people. Sometimes this first quadrant is called our arena because it's the public space of our inner life. The second quadrant consists of those things that other people know about us that we don't know about ourselves. These are our blind spots. Like a poker player, we all have tells that reveal things about us to other people that we don't know that we're revealing. And when people really get to know us, they they start to pick up on these things, things like our our personality traits or our quirks or our triggers or our biases. And when people try to give us feedback about our blind spots, we're often surprised or even defensive or even denied that that's true because these are things that we don't know about ourselves. The third quadrant consists of those things in our inner life that we know about ourselves, but that we don't let anyone else know. This is our private mental world, those things that we're conscious of, but that we keep hidden. The the realm of our our deepest fears, the things that we're ashamed of, the memories from past trauma, our inner struggles, our temptations. The guy that I knew in high school must have had an entire inner life that no one else knew about. The final quadrant consists of those things in our inner life that are unknown to us and unknown to other people. Might call this our unconscious or our subconscious. Those inner workings so deeply within ourselves that we're not conscious of them. And these things influence us in ways that we don't understand. Sometimes in small ways, sometimes in in big ways. These are the things that only God knows about our inner life. 
And in this tool, the, these four quadrants, they, they're, they're not fixed or static. They can grow or shrink depending on how hard we work at self-awareness and how much we let other people in. As we take the risk to reveal things about our third quadrant with trusted people or we ask for feedback on our blind spots or we seek God and ask Him to reveal things about ourselves that we don't see. But this tool reminds us that, that not only is it hard to know other people, that often we don't even know ourselves fully. And so today we start a new eight-week series called Questions for Jesus. And the first question we're going to talk about is, how do you know me? Throughout Jesus' three-year ministry, a lot of people asked him different questions. Some people asked Jesus questions to trick him or to, to try to trip him up. But many people asked him very sincere questions. And this series over the next two months is going to look at eight sincere questions from the fourth gospel, the gospel according to John in the New Testament part of the Bible. As Eric mentioned, um, earlier today is also Epiphany Sunday in the Christian calendar. And Epiphany Sunday actually marks a shift in church seasons from the Christmas season that technically ended yesterday, yesterday was the 12th day of Christmas, um, to the season of Epiphany that begins today. The word Epiphany comes from a Greek word that's in the Bible that means to reveal or to make known. In ordinary conversation, we use the word epiphany to, to describe a surprising realization that comes upon us. And the season of epiphany really centers around how Jesus revealed himself and still reveals himself in surprising ways. Often there are three events from Jesus' life that are emphasized on Epiphany Sunday. And, and Eric mentioned one, the, the visit of the Magi from the east. According to Matthew's gospel, Magi or wise men saw the star at Jesus' birth and traveled from the east until they found Jesus and gave him gifts and worshipped him. And since they started their journey when Jesus was born, it's likely they didn't actually find Jesus until he was about 12 years or 2 years old, contrary to what our nativity scenes often suggest, right? But this visit of the Magi was the very first time Jesus was revealed to non-Jewish people. It was an epiphany. Epiphany Sunday also recalls Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. And how he was revealed there to be the Son of God. Jesus' baptism was an epiphany. About 10 years ago, I was in the capital of Ethiopia uh, during, on Epiphany Sunday uh, teaching a leadership class for Azusa Pacific University. And as the sun began to go down, the entire city shut down and I watched a parade of, of Christians who sang and danced down the city streets. I snapped this picture while we were walking down the streets and they, they proceeded until they reached the river to celebrate the baptism of Jesus. Among many Christians in Ethiopia, Epiphany is a bigger deal than Christmas is. They shut down the entire city. And finally, Epiphany Sunday recalls Jesus' first miracle recorded in the Bible when he turned water into wine at a wedding in the town of Cana. Our series, Questions for Jesus, is an Epiphany series. Because each answer Jesus gives to a question reveals something surprising about Jesus. And my prayer is that each one of us will experience our own epiphanies with Jesus over the next two months as we spend time in John's gospel. So to, today we're going to talk about how do you know me. So would you stand with me if you're able as we look at the, the setting for this first question for Jesus. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 43 until verse 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Jesus then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You can be seated. Earlier in this chapter, in chapter 1 of John, Jesus was in the town of Bethany, and there he was baptized by John the Baptist. And there, Jesus called two of his first followers, Andrew and his brother, Peter. In our reading today, Jesus travels from Bethany to Galilee, about a hundred miles north. The region of Galilee covered the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, a freshwater lake that spanned about 13 miles. And the Sea of Galilee was surrounded by several fishing villages, among them Cana, Bethsaida, and Nazareth. And it's near Bethsaida that Jesus finds Philip and calls him to join Peter and Andrew to be his follower. Our reading focuses on the encounter between Jesus, Philip, and a man named Nathaniel. And the key word in this section is the word find. Jesus finds Philip, inviting him to become a follower. And after Jesus finds Philip, Philip finds Nathaniel. And Philip tells Nathaniel, we've found the one, the promised Messiah. Philip invites Nathaniel to meet Jesus. And then as Nathaniel talks to Jesus, Jesus reveals that he found Nathaniel long before Philip did. Now that's the only time Nathaniel appears in the Bible. Some people speculate that Nathaniel might be called Bartholomew in the other Gospels, but that's just a guess. This is the only incident we have about this guy. Philip tells Nathaniel, We have found the one. The one the entire Hebrew Scriptures prophesied and predicted. The Messiah, the promised one. Some have criticized Philip for not having all of his facts straight. Since he says that Jesus was from Nazareth, not Bethlehem, where he was born. And he calls Jesus the son of Joseph when when he was truly the son of God. Joseph was not his biological birth father. But we have to give Philip credit for trying. If, if, If we wait to tell people about Jesus until we feel like we have it all figured out, we will never tell anybody about Jesus. Now, Nathaniel is thoroughly unimpressed by what Philip says. We can also detect a little bit of a sarcastic tone when when he asks, can anything good come from Nazareth? You see, Nathanael was from the town of Cana near Bethsaida, and apparently the people in his town didn't think very highly of the people in Nazareth. But rather than get into a debate, Philip simply invites Nathanael to come and see for himself. You know, I read this and I thought, you know, one of our core values here at Glenkirk is that word invite. We want to be a church that invites everyone to come and see Jesus for themselves. Philip would have fit right in with us. Philip's invitation leads to this conversation between Jesus and Nathanael. And as soon as Jesus sees Nathanael, he says, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. You know, that's the only time the word Israelite is used in the four Gospels in the New Testament, right here. And many Bible scholars believe that that Jesus is actually intentionally alluding to an ancient story from the Old Testament book of Genesis about a guy named Jacob who God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Jacob was a crafty con man who manipulated his way through life. He conned his older brother into selling him his birthright. He he tricked his father into giving him the blessing that was reserved for his older brother. 
And after, after being tricked by Jacob, Jacob's father Isaac would say, Jacob came to me with deceit. Same word that's used here. Eventually, Jacob's lifestyle of deceit would catch up with him, leading to a wrestling match with God until he finally fully surrendered to God and God's will for his life. And when that surrender happened, God gave Jacob a new name, the name Israel, which is where this word Israelite comes from. All Jewish people are Israelites from the line of Jacob, the line of Israel. And here Jesus seems to be saying, here is a descendant of Jacob, a descendant of Israel, who has none of the deceit that his ancient ancestor had. You get the sense that this is a special moment just between Jesus and Nathanael. As Jesus sees something deep within Nathanael in his third quadrant, to use that, that Jahari window tool, that no one else has seen, and Jesus names it. For reasons we can only speculate about, Jesus' words are profoundly significant to Nathaniel. And that's what leads to his question. How do you know me? Jesus has touched a nerve deep within this man. And with gentleness and incisiveness, Jesus has revealed something that only Nathaniel knew in his inner world. Jesus answers this question by saying he saw Nathaniel under the fig tree long before Philip found him there. Now, Jesus is not saying, I was walking by earlier to get my morning Starbucks. I happened to see you under the tree. Jesus is saying that he knew Nathaniel. And whatever was happening under that tree in Nathaniel's heart and life, Jesus was aware of it even though he wasn't physically present at the time. And Nathaniel is so amazed by this man that he hardly knows who's from dreaded Nazareth that he blurts out one of the most profound confessions of faith that you'll find in all of John's gospel. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. This is Nathanael's conversion, the beginning of his journey as a follower. And although the text doesn't say it, I can almost picture Jesus smiling and saying, you believe because of that? Just wait. Verse 51, the last verse of our reading today, we find the phrase, very truly I say to you. It's the first time this phrase is used in John's gospel. It occurs 26 times in John's gospel. Sometimes it's translated, truly, truly, I say to you. This is the first time it's used. And Jesus usually uses this phrase, very truly, I say to you, because he's going to say something really, really important. And here Jesus says that Nathaniel and others who follow Jesus as disciples will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on Jesus. This saying in verse 51 alludes to another event also from the life of Jacob. In Genesis chapter 28, Jacob had a dream where he saw the angels of God ascending and descending on a ladder between heaven and earth. And I think Jesus' point here is that through Jesus, the boundary between heaven and earth has been breached. The coming of Jesus into the world is like a portal a portal between our world and heaven. Jesus is the key to understanding life on this earth and life in heaven and how those two lives fit together. Jesus is that ladder of heaven, or to use the words of those famous theologians, Led Zeppelin, um, the stairway to heaven, although no one has to try to buy it. And those who believe in Jesus, Nathaniel, Philip, you, I, we will see the reality of how heaven and earth fit together by trusting in Jesus. So let's move from this story to our lives today. Because Nathaniel's question is our question as well. How do you know me, Jesus? 
And this story reveals at least three ways that Jesus knows each one of us. First, Jesus knows our biases. He knows our biases. Nathaniel has a bias against people from Nazareth. And it almost keeps him from coming to Jesus. We don't know where he picked up this bias. Maybe kids from Nazareth bullied him in middle school. Um, Maybe people from Nazareth were more successful in the fishing business than people from Cana were. Maybe people from Nazareth wore their hair differently or dressed differently. Maybe people from Nazareth spoke Aramaic in a different accent than people from Cana spoke Aramaic. We don't know where Nathaniel's bias against people from Nazareth came from, but it was there. Jesus knew it, and it almost kept him from coming to Jesus. We all have biases in our lives. Some of them we're aware of. Some of them were not. And we don't need social science to persuade us that this is true because the Bible itself teaches it. For example, Romans chapter 12 tells us that our spiritual transformation as Christians involves the renewal of our minds because all of us have ideas and assumptions and thoughts about life that aren't always accurate or true or right. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us that even after we come to faith in Jesus, our knowledge about life is like looking through a dark glass. We don't always see everything accurately. I remember years ago when my oldest son, Wes, was in kindergarten. I took him to McDonald's after I picked him up and he got out of school for for lunch. And we, we were standing in line and there was this guy also in line that was making me really nervous. He, he was dressed how I thought a, a, a gang member might dress, and, and, and he kept looking, kind of looking at me and then looking away, and, and I, I, I was convinced he was going to rob the place or rob me, and so I started mentally preparing what I was going to do if he tried to rob the McDonald's. The more I thought about it, the more, more persuaded I became that he was going to rob the place. He was up to no good. I was scanning the exits. I would grab my son's hand and was holding it tight, My heart rate picked up, and then the guy looked right at me, locked eyes on me, and said, Tim, I haven't seen you since high school, and ran over and gave me a hug. And as I later replayed the scene in my mind, I realized that he wasn't really doing anything suspicious. It was my own implicit bias that was playing tricks on me. Jesus knows our biases. And like Nathaniel, we all have them. And I hope your biases don't keep you from coming to him. Jesus also sees our character. He sees our character. Jesus saw that Nathaniel was an Israelite in whom there was no deceit. He sees our character as well. He sees what we feel and what we think and what we believe and what we perceive to be true. He knows why dogs terrify us or why the smell of freshly baked bread comforts us. He knows what tempts us and makes us afraid. He knows the secrets that we carry and the the things that cause us to feel ashamed. Psalm 139 in the Bible says that God is intimately acquainted with us. He searches us and knows us and understands our ways. Hebrews chapter 4 says that everything about our life is open and laid bare before Jesus. This can be a comforting thought and an uncomfortable thought at the same time. That someone can see into our character so deeply to see who we are. And Jesus sees it all. The good and the bad. The beautiful and the ugly. The saintly and the sinful. Finally, Jesus understands our stories. He understands our stories. Long before Philip found Nathanael, Jesus already knew Nathanael's story what was happening in his life. He would understood where Nathaniel had been, and he understands where we've been as well. 
He understands every twist in this topsy-turvy life that we are living. He knows every trauma and every achievement. He can make meaning out of things and situations that seem meaningless to us. He can understand even the most painful suffering because he himself has suffered. Twelve years ago, I was going through a very difficult and painful time in my own life. My life had taken a twist that I never imagined it would take. And I remember one day it dawned on me that that particular twist in my life didn't take Jesus by surprise. That Jesus was not saying, wow, I never could have seen that coming. That Jesus understood my story. And that gave me great comfort. Jesus understands your story. And so when we ask Jesus the question, how do you know me? We discover that Jesus knows us even better than we know ourselves. He sees all four quadrants of our inner world. He knows our biases, sees our character, understands our stories. You see, being known by Jesus is an invitation to know Him. As we realize that Jesus sees us just as thoroughly as He saw Nathaniel. We are invited to come to know Jesus as Nathaniel did. To enter into a relationship, a space where we experience being known by Jesus to the depths of our being and we get to know him. And the way this happens is through faith or belief. In fact, the entire reason the gospel of John was written was so that we might believe like Nathaniel did. And that started Nathaniel on a journey where he would understand life as never before. That he would understand heaven and earth would be open to him and he would see how his life on this earth related to to life in the next. And it can happen for any of us as well. It was an epiphany that changed everything. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this question that Jesus answers, that he answers for Nathaniel and he answers for us, that we are known, that we are known, and that in that knowledge, we are loved. Father, thank you for knowing us through Jesus. Thank you for loving us through Jesus. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.